I invite you to take a copy of the Bible and open up to Psalm chapter 110. Psalm 110 is where we will be today. If you are looking along, following along in one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 509 in the Pew Bible. If you are a visitor with us today, we're glad that you are here. I want to invite you to take one of the Connect cards from one of the seats around you and complete that, place that in the offering plate as it goes by later in our service. That'll give us a record of your visit and allow us to follow up with you and share with you some of the things God's doing here at Seven Oaks. Uh, we're continuing today in our series, our Advent series, on the Psalms of Royalty. And one of the things that I have come to admire about particular writers is the ability of a writer to be able to say something very profound, but yet do it in a very quick and succinct way. And David has certainly done that in Psalm 110, particularly as it pertains to Jesus Christ. In just a few verses, David gives us a psalm that is the most quoted passage from the Old Testament in the New Testament. We see it quoted in the Gospels. We see it quoted in the book of Acts. And as we'll see a little bit later today, a a commentary on Psalm 110 makes up a great deal of the entire book of Hebrews. So this is a passage that is important to our understanding of Jesus and who he is. So with that, if you have got your place in Psalm 110, I invite you to stand with me as we read it together. Psalm 110, starting in verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this passage. We thank you, Lord, that it is here for a purpose. We we confess that your word is living and active And Father, we ask this morning that as we come to this passage, you illuminate it, help us to apply it, and Lord, that it would cause us to grow in our worship of your Son. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our main idea of the sermon today is that Jesus is our eternal King and our perfect priest. Jesus is our eternal king and our perfect priest. And as we look at our passage, we're going to see David tell us three things about Jesus. That he is our eternal and sovereign king, that he is our eternal and perfect priest, and that he is also a victorious warrior. He's an eternal and sovereign king, an eternal and perfect priest, and a victorious warrior. All of which we see here in Psalm 110. The first being that Jesus is the eternal and sovereign king. Look back with me at verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, one of the keys to interpreting this psalm is figuring out who it is that's speaking here. Now, David is the one who wrote this psalm. That is, it says here, it's a a psalm of David. And fortunately for us, we have the New Testament to help us understand who is speaking. So David is the writer, but yet David, the king of Israel, is writing to someone else. When he says here in verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord. David is referring to someone as my Lord. And now we know that my Lord refers to Christ. And one of the clues to this is in in verse 1. You see in the English translation, there are two uses of the word Lord. But if you're using the ESV or one of the other English translations, the first, you'll notice, Lord is in all caps. And anytime you see the word Lord in all caps, that is a translation of Yahweh, which is the formal name of God in the Old Testament. The next word, Lord, is Adonai which means my Lord or my master. And at times we see that refer to God, but there are other times in the Old Testament where it refers to people. David refers to Saul later on as my Adonai. We see it, Elisha. So we know we have Lord, God is speaking to David's Lord and master. 
And he's describing a conversation between God the Father and God the Son. So how are we confident of this? Well, one is we know that Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 22. Matthew 22, Jesus is speaking, and he quotes this passage. He says, now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. See, they've been peppering Jesus with questions, and now he's going to turn the table on them. He says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And the Pharisees say, the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him questions. So what was Jesus doing in this moment in Matthew? He's trying to stump the Pharisees. But what we need to see here is that Jesus is saying that David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus. Make no mistake, David is not talking about himself in Psalm 110 verse 1. He's talking about Jesus, who is both David's son, yet he is David's king. One of the, uh, one of a recent series, or not recent, several seasons now, on Netflix called The Crown, which is about the life of Queen Elizabeth II. And in the first season, there's this moment when her father, George VI, has just died. And she realizes that she is now the sovereign. And her, the queen mother, her grandmother, Mary, she sees her and she's in her, uh, in her mourning wear. She's, she's got the mourning veil on. And she looks at her. She looks at her granddaughter, Elizabeth. And what does she do? She bows. An acknowledgement that, yes, this lady, this girl, is my granddaughter, yet she's my queen. Maybe even more importantly, she's her queen. And later, Paul directly quotes again Psalm 110 and Acts 2 when he says that Christ is seated at that right hand of God. Not David. So the New Testament writers give testimony that David is talking about Christ here in Psalm 110. And he says that, then God the Father says to God the Son, I will make your enemies your footstool. When you get time, look up online the footstool of King Tut. When they, uh, I think it's just a replica now, but when they found King Tut's tomb, they found his footstool. And carved on his footstool are all of the countries and all of the names of Egypt's enemies. And so the symbolism of when he sat on his throne, he would have a footstool to rest his feet on. That's the image we need to have in our mind. That's the picture that we have. All the enemies will be put under Christ's feet. But how exactly is that going to come to pass? Let's look at verse 2. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. God is going to place Christ's enemies under his rule. Christ is king over all. And we have witnessed the power of his kingship in his resurrection and in his ascension to the right hand. But there is still a battle that is going on even today. And that's what's being described here. But yet in the midst of this battle, the Son of God, Jesus, is reigning among his enemies. He is at work bringing all things under his control doing what Adam and Eve were supposed to do. They were supposed to be kings and viceroys, God's representatives on earth, and they didn't do it fully. So Jesus came to complete it. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the final victory will come when death is finally defeated. Death's sentence has already been been laid out, but it won't be meted out fully until Christ returns in the days to come. The symbol of power is his scepter that he's reaching out. And I think what we're seeing here is the work of the gospel. Remember what Paul says in Romans 1, that the power of God is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to save, and that is going forward. Making God's children of those who were formerly his his enemies. And then in verse 3, we see that there are those who volunteer or sacrifice, as it is more accurately translated, a foreshadowing of what Paul would say in Romans 12, of God's people offering themselves as living sacrifice 
who, saved by God's grace, strive to live in holiness, fueled by grace, so that we might continue on in his army, going to the nations. Those of us who have been called by God, who have a role in subduing the earth, of spreading the rule of God through the gospel. Now, don't miss this. There are only two groups of people that have been mentioned here in this passage. The enemies of God and those who have submitted to him. There is not a third group here. There isn't an, an enemy of God, that's, or there isn't anybody who's an in-between. There's no conscientious objectors here that David's writing about. Friends, we live today in what is called the day of salvation. That's what the Gospels call it. From the time Jesus ascended to heaven to the time when Jesus returns is the day of salvation. It's the time for us to acknowledge the supremacy of King Jesus in hearing the gospel, repenting of sin, and placing our faith in Christ. Right now is the time to join his side because at some point that day will be over and the time and the opportunity to make that decision will have passed. You will admit and acknowledge Jesus Christ's supremacy one way or the other, either gladly and willingly and with worship or with regret that we didn't see it earlier. Jesus Christ is this eternal king. It finally says, from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. Now, even in Hebrew, this is a very difficult phrase to translate. It's very strange at what David is communicating. But what I think we see here is David describing the rule and reign of Jesus, that he will do so with youthful vigor. Remember back last week to Psalm 89, the psalmist was lamenting that the energy of his youth had gone Yet Jesus retains the youthful vigor. Jesus, seated at the right hand of God, he's not old. He is perfect. He hasn't aged. He hasn't had the ravages of age affect his body. And one day, those of us in Christ, we will receive that new body as well, just like he is. Jesus is the forever young, eternal, and supreme king. Next, we're going to see that David describes Jesus as our eternal high priest. Jesus is our eternal high priest. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this phrase is loaded with significance that we need to understand if we're to grow in our understanding of who Christ is and what he has done on our behalf. Now, Yahweh is speaking to the same Lord, Adonai, that we saw back in verse 1. We can be confident of that. And this is significant because now he's saying, not only are you a king, you are also a priest. Now, why does that matter? The reason that matters is because in, the, in Israel, the king and the priest were both distinct roles. And there was not to be any crossover. God took that very seriously. There was something, there was a role the king played, and there was a role the priest played. We see in the life of King Saul, when he tried to take on priestly duties, God took the kingdom away from him. And in 2 Chronicles, when King Uzziah, when he goes and he burns incense, something that only the priests were supposed to do, and God strikes him with leprosy. So God took this seriously. So now God is saying to his son, you are both a king and a priest. He's the only one who could fulfill both of these offices, and as we'll see, fulfill both of them perfectly. But yet it's even foreshadowed in the Old Testament prophets in Zechariah 6 when, I, when Israel is told that there is coming one who is a branch, capital B when you read the passage, who would rebuild the temple and in this temple there would be a throne and on this throne would sit a priest. We understand that be a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who would fulfill that. And we understand from what we've seen of the king's and what we've seen of the royal psalms, we have a pretty strong understanding of what the king was supposed to do. He was supposed to represent God's justice and God's rule. So what was a priest supposed to do? Well, Hebrews 5.1 5, gives us a quick summary. Hebrews 5.1 says, Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for their sins. So in short... The priest was an inherited position 
who served as a mediator of the covenant between Israel and God. He was to intervene on behalf of man to God, offering sacrifices. That's why we he often hear what they do, intercede. We use that as it pertains to intercessory prayer. We pray on behalf of someone else. And as I said, it was an inherited position. You could not be a priest unless you were born of the tribe of Levi. So if you were from another tribe, you were not able to become a priest. And he appeased God's wrath by offering sacrifices, and he was responsible for the purity of Israel. So if the king represented God to the people, then the priest represented the people to God. Let me say that again. If the king represented God to the people, the priest represented the people to God. Now, he says that he is in the same order of Melchizedek. So who is he? Why does David even bring him up? You might be familiar with this name, and maybe you're not. Now, there is way more, I'll go ahead and say, that we could say about Melchizedek than we have time for today. So I'd encourage you, read back through the book of Hebrews, and it will, it will expound way more and get, enhance our understanding of the significance of Melchizedek. But he's the first person that we see serving only person other than Jesus we see serving as a king and a priest. And we find his story in Genesis 14. So turn back with me to Genesis 14, and we'll read very quickly the passage where it explains or where we see him in Scripture. And this is the only place he shows up, and it's a very quick episode that we see. Now to set the scene... Abram has just won a battle. There was a battle between one side there were five kings, on the other side there were four kings, and Abram's nephew Lot has been captured. And Abram goes in with his family, and they defeat these kings, and they rescue Lot. And he's about to have a conversation with the king of Sodom. And then we see this interlude, Genesis 14, 17 through 20. And after his return from the defeat of Keter Laomer, forgive me for that, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, which we now understand to be Jerusalem, who Hebrews tells us means peace, king of peace, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram give, gave him a tenth of everything. So he gave him a tithe of the spoils that he had just won. Now, the writer of Hebrews gives us commentary on Melchizedek in Hebrews 5 through 7 and helps us understand why he's important. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say that Melchizedek is superior even to the Levitical priests. Abram, who was the ancestor of the Levitical priest, gave tithe to Melchizedek. Therefore, Melchizedek is superior to the Levitical priests. See how we're connecting the dots, how we're doing the math, whatever cliche we might use there. But we have no genealogy. We don't know where Melchizedek came from. And the writer of Hebrews says Christ is very similar. He is, the, he is a new and better priest who is a priest appointed by God in the same way that Melchizedek was a better priest who did not inherit the position by being a member of any tribe. He says, as a matter of fact, he came from a totally different tribe, the tribe of Judah. And with him being a different new priest, he's able to be the mediator of a new covenant, we're told in Hebrews. He comes in the fullness of time to be a new, better priest, one who would be a priest forever which shows him to be better than any of the other priests that came before him, who would ongoing, who have an ongoing work of intercessory or intercession. How do we know he's better? The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 7. In verse 26, it says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests, meaning the high priests that came before him, 
to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, in other words, the word of the oath of God, which came later than the law, it points a son who has been made perfect forever. All of the priests of Levi, all of the priests of the Old Testament were sinners themselves. They had to offer sacrifice on their own behalf in addition to doing it on behalf of the people. Christ was perfect. He didn't have to offer sacrifices on behalf of himself. So he was the better forever priest, the mediator of a new, better covenant, a covenant that didn't have to be didn't have to be mediated day after day after day. Picture it this way. Let's say you have a pipe in your home and it's very old and it's very brittle. And once a year, it springs forward a leak and you go and you fix it. Maybe you have some type of tape that you put over it and that holds back the water for just a little while. It holds back impending disaster for just a little while. But then you finally, somebody comes and they fix it and they don't just take the pipe, they replace the whole system. And this system never has to be replaced. It'll never break. That's what Christ did in the new covenant as our priest. Yes, sacrifices that were offered daily and yearly held back God's wrath a little bit, a little bit at a time until Christ came and held it back permanently from those who are in Christ. But don't miss what the sacrifice was. The writer of Hebrews in 7.26 says, we, he's not sacrificing animals or goats or sheep or bulls as we did in the Old Testament. It says that Christ offered up himself as a final, perfect sacrifice. And friends, this is why there had to be an incarnation. If God, if Jesus was to be our human priest, he had to come as a human and live a perfect life as a perfect human, to be sacrificed as lambs and animals were without blemish. That's why he had to condescend, cloaking himself for a season, putting on human flesh, veiling the glory, as in some of the songs we just sang say that. That's why he came to a little town as a tiny, vulnerable baby. All of the power of God in human flesh. Now, this is not a perfect analogy, But what I think of, if you ever think of the Disney movie, Aladdin, when the genie is explaining, what does he do? Phenomenal, cosmic power, itty bitty living space. He talks about living in the lamp. I know it's not perfect. And we understand that God was fully God. Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time. But we understand he took on limits, human limits. And earlier in Hebrews in chapter 2, he says that Jesus was tempted in every way that we were tempted, suffered the way that we suffered. I think we could surmise that Jesus probably got stomach viruses in the same way that we do, endured the same miseries that we do, but yet remained perfect and without sin, being the final sacrifice for us. Friends, Christ alone is our means of salvation. It's not our works. It's not another deity. He, is a, he alone is the way that we are saved from sin. And he is our only intercessor. The only one who intervenes on our behalf before God. No other saint does this. Mary does not do this. It is Christ alone. Our intercessor, our perfect and eternal priest. And finally, David shows Christ to be a victorious warrior. Look at verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment from among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. Now the setting here is shifted from the throne room where we see the members of the Trinity having fellowship and conversation. It's shifted from there to a battlefield where Jesus sitting at the right hand of God is sharing in the power of God as he is subduing the earth. David is telling us of the Lord, his Adonai, what he's going to do in the name of Yahweh. That even though he's seated seated at the Father's right hand, he is conquering the world. But this isn't just a movement of a scene. The setting hasn't just changed. The time has changed as well. We've now moved to the end of time, to the book of Revelation. 
or Christ. And setting into motion all of the things that were prophesied about him. The time of salvation and the time for salvation is now over and God is executing his judgment as a righteous king and victorious warrior. We've moved from Psalm 2 where this is prophesied to Psalm 110 where it is taking place. We see Revelation 19 taking place where a baby who is no longer a baby is riding as a conquering warrior, king, and priest on a white horse. Revelation 19 says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one seated, sitting on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. That means crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He shares his glory and his power with no one else. But we read this, and it makes us uncomfortable. We don't like what we see here. We like to think of baby Jesus in a manger, and we like to think that Jesus stayed that way. We want to keep him in that manger. But friends, that's not what Jesus did. Praise God that's not what he did. Praise God he didn't stay as a vulnerable baby in a manger. The truth is we do not get to choose how we see Jesus. We have to see Jesus for who he is. We see the living word of God on his terms, not on our own. We can't shape Jesus into who we want him to be. We can't ignore the certain parts of scripture and what they say about him and ignore the things that make us uncomfortable and emphasize the things that cause to bring about warm, fuzzy feelings. That doesn't change who Christ is and what he came to do. Christ is Lord of all and he is a conquering warrior. And his reign will conquer all, including death, which is our biggest enemy. And as we said before, one day we will all acknowledge, willingly or unwillingly, his supremacy. In verse 7, it says, He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. I think this is a picture of the king refreshing himself, going to the brook after the battle is over, after he is weary Drinking from the brook. Now, there's all kinds of, of, of uh, scholarship on what this could be, but I think it's very clear. It's the king. He's refreshing himself after the battle is won. After all is completed, resting, refreshing. Psalm 110 has given us a very quick yet profound look at the storyline of Scripture and the different roles of Christ. So what we do with that information is literally a life or death decision. And so how should we then live? We ask ourselves, is my confidence and hope in Christ the royal priest? Is my confidence and hope in Christ the royal priest? For those of us who are believers, at times we may struggle with assurance of our salvation. We may struggle sometimes with the assurance of God's goodness and God's love. The battles with sin get long, they get hard, and we begin to doubt. We struggle in our faith. We give up and give in to sin. And when we are faced with those temptations, we must remember that Christ, our Savior, faced the same ones and is today praying for us. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who were considering abandoning their faith and going back to the Old Testament system of doing things. They said, this Christian life is too hard. Let me go back to the things that I can do in my own strength. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, listen to who Jesus is and what he has done and what he is doing and draw strength from that. Take assurance from the fact that all Christ has done and that he's continuing to pray for us and intercede for us. His ministry for us did not end on the cross. It's an ongoing ministry today. And we need to remember when we battle temptation, when we battle sin, when we battle discouragement, we pray for strength knowing that at the same time, God the Son is praying for us. 
interceding for us. Because he wants to see us sanctified. He wants to see us grow. That's what he told Simon Peter in Luke 22. Jesus interceded for his people even while he was here on earth. And it continues, but he says to him in Luke 22, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you and that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fall, may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Christ doesn't want us to fail and he's praying. He's given us the means to grace and salvation and he is praying that we continue in faith. The knowledge of that truth should give us confidence that Christ means what he says and he'll complete the work that he began in us the day of salvation. If you're not a Christian today, then the call and the application is to repent and listen to the call of Christ. As I said, today is the day of salvation, but one day the day of salvation will end. Place your faith in Christ and Christ for salvation as he is the only true king and the only priest we have before God. Christ will be your judge, but will he be your savior? If your confidence before God is in yourself and in your deeds, then you have no confidence and you have no hope. Our confidence is what Jesus has done for us on the cross and in his resurrection. It is not our deeds, it is his deeds, his deed. And when we repent and place our faith in Christ, the King of Kings, the Supreme Warrior, our forever priest, then we are saved. And when our hope and our confidence is in the one who died and rose again, then we have the greatest hope that cannot be taken. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks this morning for your son, Jesus. We thank you, God, that, Father, he is priest and that he is king. God, that he reigns forever. And, God, that he intercedes for us forever. Father, that he's doing so even now for those of us who are struggling with sin, who are struggling with doubt. And Father, we pray that with confidence we would draw near to you because you are pleased with us and have given us righteousness in your son, Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen.